once again for picking into another edition of Sasquatch Encounters. Today's guest comes from us from Indiana and is willing to share his remarkable encounter uh, that took place while visiting family in Kentucky. Please welcome to the show, Kurt. Hello, Kurt. How are you today? I'm fine, thank you. Great, great. Hey, listen, I want to say thank you for uh, taking the time to share your encounter. And uh, I've always felt that the more people that step up and, and tell their stories and their encounters gives us a better opportunity to learn from these and get a better educated guess on what these things really are and what's going on out there. My pleasure. Now, now your your experience happened when? Uh, it was 1982. 1982. And can you tell me what time of the year it was? Was it cold out, warm out? Uh, it's about mid-July. Um, and um, I was spending the, spending a few weeks with my cousins out in the country there in Kentucky. Uh, it was um, in between baseball baseball season, so I had some time to spend. And uh, it was about mm, we the, we started off about three o'clock in the afternoon, but the actual encounter uh, was around close to dark, around seven thirty, quarter till eight at night. Great. So, so you were out there all day, then you were. Um, what was were you out there camping, or what was the reason? I mean, obviously, you know you don't have to go into a whole lot of detail, but what was the reason you were out there? I mean, was well, my cousin and I, we had a there was a there was a pretty big lake out there in the property, and uh, we used to go fishing all the time and catch a lot of bluegill, bass, and catfish. And there was a little island out in the middle of the lake. We called it Tom Sawyer's Island uh, because we would always go to the islands and. Uh, it was kind of like our little hideout, our little clubhouse. So we decided just to go hang out on the island, do some fishing, just kind of uh, get away from the house and just just hang out for the day. Awesome, awesome. So, so you're on this island. Then tell us what happened. I mean, what what was it, you know, what happened after that? Well, we we we'd hike. Uh, we actually took a couple mules um, because the way the land set up is they're not actually mountains. Uh, they 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 call them the knobs. Um, that's what my grandpa and, and all my uncles called them, but they're kind of, to me, coming from the city, they were mountains because they're really steep hills. They, they'd go up really high, and then they would kind of flatten off, and you'd have a nice big, some of them, nice big field, then another hill. And so we went over several hills and several miles. So a lot of times we like to take the mules, and sometimes we'd strap a ghetto blaster on the back of one or fish and tackle and stuff. And they would just kind of haul things for us, coolers. So we took the mules to the lake. Um, we were going to do a little bit of fishing, like I said, hang out. So we fished from the bank for a little bit. Um, it, like I said, it was the middle of July, so the fish weren't really biting at that time of the day. So um, we were like, hey, let's let's take a swim. So we, we went and we swam around, messed around for a little bit in the water and got a little tired. So we swam over to the island and... Um, sat on the bank of the island a little while and talked and um, threw some rocks and whittled on some sticks a little bit and we talked about lighting a fire. Um, and I guess we were just, we were deep from the walk and everything and uh, we, we just fell asleep. You know, we were under a shade tree and fell asleep. Sure. Um, so um, and it wasn't uncommon for us to, to go out there and, and sleep and camp and stuff. So it was really no big deal. Um, we didn't have to be anywhere at any certain time and, um, and all the grown-ups knew we were out there, knew we spent many hours out there, so it was no nothing unusual. Um, so I think I was the first one to wake up, and uh, I woke up. And the reason I woke up is the uh, the mules were just braying and kicking and just and, you know making a big commotion over on the bank. And I was thinking, what in the world is going on? So I set up and. My cousin got up about the same time, and we stood up and looked and looked over at the, the mules, saw the mules over there, and then about that time, on the corner of our eye, um, we saw the creature, um, and the creature actually was squatting down, and this, I'd say, maybe 30 to 50 yards away from where we were at, um, but like I said, we were on the island. It was on the bank of um, bank of the lake. Um so we saw it, we both looked at it, looked at each other, and then I motioned, we just got down on the ground. There's some tall weeds and stuff. I mean, it was just scary, so we just got down on our bellies on the ground to hide ourselves. 
We didn't have any weapons except a couple pocket knives. Um, and so we were just kind of looking at first. I thought, who is out here? And what are they doing? They're going through a tackle box. What is going on? So we looked over there, and then really quickly after our eyes got adjusted, uh, we noticed that whatever it was was huge, and we were looking at the back of it. Um, it had uh, dark dark brown hair um, over covering its whole body from the back. Um, it didn't look like it was real long hair, but what was kind of weird about it is there was some longer hair on the back of the head and the shoulders that looked like it was lighter than the rest of the hair, almost like the sun had bleached it a little bit. Um, so it's kind of two-tone color. Um, so we sat there just, I, I, I couldn't believe it. I'd heard of, you know, Sasquatch, and I'd watched the Leonard Nimoy In Search Of episode when I was a kid and thought that was really, really cool. Um, so we sat there, and, and I was thinking in my mind, is, is this a Sasquatch? Is this, you know, is this a person? What, what's going on? Is it someone playing a joke on us? Um, but we were both very, very quiet and um, and really scared. Well, about that time it stands up and the time when it stood up, that's when it really just, it, every hair on my body stood on end because, um, as a kid, my father used to take me a lot to the Cincinnati Bengals, uh, football games at Riverfront. Sure. And back, back then, you know, you could walk out on the field after the games and walk up to the locker room and, and meet the players. Well, I was always a football player and I was a lineman. So Anthony Munoz was one of my favorite players. Yeah. And he was a young player with the Cincinnati Bengals at the time, and I had the privilege to meet him on several occasions out on the field and shake his hand and get his autograph and, and things of that nature. So I actually knew, you know, Anthony Munoz was 6'6", six, 6'7", six, six, um, about 350 pounds. So I had stood right next to him, knew how big he was. Um, and when this creature stood up, it made Anthony Munoz, it dwarfed him. Um, from from my vantage point, and that's what just totally took my breath away. Um, is the, the the size and the and so we kept looking. Stands up. It's got our tackle box in its hand, and it's pulling things out of the bottom drawer, like the uh, the stringer. Um, it pulls the stringer out and throws the stringer on the ground. Then some bobbers that was in the bottom pulls some bobbers out. Kind of looks at them. Throws the bobbers on the ground. Um, was taking the stuff out of the tackle box and then kind of just throws the tackle box on the ground. Um, at this time, the donkeys are still just going crazy. I mean, they are just going crazy. Um, and, I, and I assume they're probably just as scared as we are because we're laying there on our bellies in tall grass, just, just trembling, not saying a word. Uh, and I'm thinking, I hope this thing doesn't see that we're here. I hope, you know, it doesn't... Um, come over here because I didn't know what it would do, do to us if it knew we were there. And I didn't even know if it, if, if it could get to us through the water, but I didn't want to find out. Um, so the donkeys are still just going crazy. And this creature stands up and he looks over at the donkeys and starts to walk over toward that way. And they were probably 15, 20 feet away from it. And then I thought to myself, oh, I, I, if he kills the donkeys... Um, right here in front of us, I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, I mean, it, I was scared to death at that point that that's what was getting ready to happen. I was going to witness this whole thing. Um, so he started walking toward him and, and hits its head on a branch as it's walking toward him. Pretty nice-sized branch of a tree. Um, hits its head, and I could tell this by the way it hit it that it didn't mean to do it, and it kind of shrugged it off reach up with its right hand, grabs the branch, and just rips the branch off the tree, throws it down on the wow. ground. Um, so I'm like, wow. And then uh, we're still watching, and about that time we hear a, a just a blood-curdling scream from the other side of the lake, um, the total opposite side of where the creature is at, this really loud, blood-curdling scream. Um, it didn't sound human. Um, it was just the weirdest, um, scariest sound I'd ever heard. It just echoed through the air. And the creature, after this, we hear the scream, the creature looks over in the direction across the lake, looks over there, turns, and when it turned, it turned its entire body around. So it wasn't like 
moving its neck around or looking like a person would. It turns its whole body around, looks that direction, and then starts walking through the tall grass around the lake. Um, we're still on our bellies. We're still watching. The whole time I'm taking a really good look at this thing to make sure that I'm really seeing what I'm seeing. Sure. Um, and, you know, so it's walking, taking pretty nice strides around the lake, but it's not running. Um, it's just moving at a pretty good pace. So it, we watch it. It's a nice size lake. Gets around the lake to the other side of the lake and disappears into the tree line. Well, from that point, you know, I whisper over to my cousin and I'm just like, oh, my God, you know, I cannot believe that we just seen that. Have you ever seen anything like that before? And he's just, he's almost in tears. I mean, he is so scared. He's a couple years younger than me, and he was just scared to death, trembling, scared to death. And I said, well, let's wait and make sure it's gone before we get back in the water and go back home. Um, because there was no way in the world we wanted to run into this thing after, you know, seeing its size and everything. Sure. So we, we we lay there for a long time, and it started to it was it started to get really dark. The sun started to go down. Um, the darker it got, the scarier we got. And uh, we finally got in the water really slow and just kind of um, belly crawled to the um, to the bank. Uh, we left the toolbox. We left everything there. We grabbed the the mules by the reins. We didn't even get on them and ride them. We just walked them out of the area really slow until we were about a mile away. And then we got on them. And these mules, were they weren't old. Um, I don't know if you've ever rode a mule before, but it's different than riding a horse. So it's not like you get on one and just take off real fast. But they're faster than you think they are. They're, they're really good in the terrain that we were going to be in. I mean, they're real sure-footed, and they just move at a really nice pace, faster than a human would, would move. So we finally get on the mules, and we and we ride back. Um, back to the, the property where the houses are at. Well, the entire time, it's it's about a two-hour ride. We're looking behind our shoulder every five minutes, it seems like, just to make sure nothing's behind us. I mean, we keep looking, 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 looking. Um, we finally get back, and um, my grandpa um, was there. We go in, and we're both as white as a ghost. The first thing he says is, what have you guys been up to? What have you guys got yourself into? And we told him the story. And I thought he was going to think we were crazy. Uh, but what he said was he looks at us really nonchalant, and he starts to walk away, and he says, I've always told you boys when you're out in the woods to look out for them damn creek monsters. You know, and basically we had heard him talk, him and his brothers talk about the creek monsters when we were young, and they had supposedly seen them quite a few times throughout the years. Um, when they grew up on the property, there were hundreds of acres of land and hills and knobs and woods. Uh, a creek ran through it. So my grandpa and his brothers, um, they grew up on that property during the, in the 1930s and 40s, and that's where they lived their whole life. And my grandpa had talked about them all the time, but I always thought that he was just telling tall tales like grandpas like to do to the kids a lot of times, sure, you know. Sure. Um, but he'd always call them creek monsters. Um, and, um, I'd always imagine something more like the creature from the black lagoon when every sacred monsters when, as a kid. Um, but then after I actually saw what I saw and then he said, those were the Creek monsters. Then I realized, ah, that's what he's been talking about all these years was, uh, Sasquatch because that had to be a Sasquatch, um, from what I seen. I mean, it wasn't a man. It was not a bear. Uh, we were too far out for anyone to be out there. It was way too big. It was way too muscular. Um, and still to this day, every time I, I hear people who don't believe, um, people who are skeptics, people who talk about not finding bones, not having evidence, I know in the pit of my heart what I saw that day with my own two eyes, and there's not one doubt in my mind that those things exist. No, one down my mind. Well, Kurt, you sound pretty sincere, and, and, I, and I, I don't doubt your story at all. Um, but I, I do have a couple of questions, though, about your story, if you don't mind. Um, sure. Now, you mentioned that you were on an island. You swam to the island, and the Sasquatch was on the regular land, correct? Yes. Okay. Just want to make sure that it was understood that it, that it wasn't on the island with you, that it was across the, the waterway. Yes. Yeah. How, 
How far away would you say you were from it? I would say probably 30 to 50 yards, I would say, away from it. That's yeah, pretty close. I always, when I, when I, when at the time, you know, as, as, as you know, a 13 year old, you don't really think about far, but I always looked at it as, okay, a football field. How much yeah. of a football field away was I? And then that was a good way for me to correlate how, how far away it was. You know, about 30, 30 to 50 yards around that, around that, I would say is a really good guesstimate. Right. And, and I like that you used Anthony Munoz as a, uh, a scale per se for this thing because uh, I've actually met Anthony Munoz myself several times, and he is a very, very big, big guy. <laughs> yes, he is, he is a very big guy. Um, my cousin and I actually, um, about two or three days later, we um, went back to the lake and um, took a couple of our other cousins with us um, to see if we could find tracks uh, and to get our tackle box and things and see if we could find any type of evidence of what we found because our other cousins weren't buying it. They were all saying that we were making it up. So we do go back. We and we didn't. It had rained uh, since then, so we didn't see any tracks. There was a lot of grass in the area where it was standing tall grass. There wasn't really a lot of mud or sand or anything per se. Um, but what we did see when we were there is um, the branch that the um, creature hit its head on when it picked it up, when it grabbed the branch and pulled the branch off the tree, it threw the branch on the ground. The branch that it threw on the ground was there. It was big enough to where if one of us, and I got a probably pretty number about six foot two and about 250 pounds back then. I was, you know, I was still pretty big, you know, for 13, 14 years old. So I picked the branch up with my hand, and my entire hand could not go around the branch. Um, I couldn't get my whole hand around it. So that's about how big it was. So I look, we look up at the tree, and there was probably about a two-foot section where it had broken it off that was still attached to the tree. Um, and like I said, it had hit its head on this branch. So when we went, we took a tape measure. We were going to measure the tracks. It was one of the, um, the, the kind that... Um, it, it's made out of cloth. You can just roll it up, um, right. like they measure your length, uh, your uh, inseam, and things with. So we we got one of those. And it was a pretty long one, and we uh, measured from the the branch that was broken off to the ground, and it was eight foot four inches. I'll never forget that one. Uh, eight foot four inches, and it hit its head on it. So I don't know if it had, you know, how much of its head hit it, but I do know that it was tall enough that it hit its head on a branch that was eight foot four inches from the ground. Right. Yeah, that's that's up there. Um, now, when you said you you got a good look at it, you you, you, know, you mentioned earlier that you saw it, you saw it crystal clear and you, and you looked at it. Yes. Did you, did you see any facial uh, expressions or any facial features? Well, I, I did notice, and that's one of the things I was I was trying to really look because I was still trying to to, to think maybe there was a good chance that it was a person, it was someone playing a joke, that it was a mask. You know, I, 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 that was my first thought. So I do know that um, I didn't get a good look at the eyes. The eyes did, per se, they looked dark. Um, I didn't see any whites to the eyes because we were 30 to 50 yards away. And, and at first it had its back toward us. And when it did turn around, it was from a side view. So it never did turn around to where I had a full frontal view of it. If it would have done that, then I would have thought it was looking at us and I probably would have had a heart attack. So it kind of looked over at the mules and I got like a, a profile. Um, so the, the, the eyes looked dark. Um, it had a, a, a pretty distinguished brow line above, you know, eyebrow line um, from its eye area um, down to around its mouth. It didn't look like it, it had very much hair. The skin looked more like um, a person that has a real dark tan. Um, it wasn't it wasn't brown. It wasn't black, but a real real dark tan type skin. Um, it never opened its mouth. But the mouth did uh, it did appear to have the lips look relatively thick, um, and it looked like it had a mane of hair um, that was longer than the actual fur coat itself. Um, so it's like it had the fur and the hair that was a little bit thicker that kind of hung down, um, you know, hung down on on the other fur uh, that was a little bit lighter. Um, so it didn't get to see any type of teeth, and the nose was flat, but it wasn't like a monkey's nose. It wasn't really flat. You know, it it still had a um, 
you know, like I said, look very, very human, but like a uh, almost Neanderthal-like. Um, you know, like you see the Neanderthal man, like, and I've looked at a lot of pictures and tried to, you know, tried to draw what I've seen. I'm not a real good artist, but um, it was almost like, a, you know, it, it definitely didn't seem gorilla-ish to me. Sure. Uh, except maybe the body. The definitely look very, very the hands. I, you know, the hands um, didn't get a real close look at the, the fingers and hands uh, when it was going through the tackle box. But I do know that the inside of the hands seemed to to not have any fur on them. Seemed to be the same color um, as the um, as the skin that was on its face, a dark tan color. And I didn't re- get a real good look at the feet because the grass around the, the lake was pretty tall. Um, so I didn't get, because I was definitely thinking, well, if it's Bigfoot, it has to have these really big feet. You know, so we were, I, so when I was laying on my belly, I was just trying to get a, a really good look at exactly what I was. I was seeing because I knew I'd be describing it to, to my grandpa and, and, and to my dad because I, I was just, like I said, it was just scared me to death. Oh, I can imagine. I can imagine, especially being... You know, 13, 14 years old, and being in that situation be a uh, be a very scary, scary situation to be in. Oh um, yeah, yeah. What, what about the top of its head? Did it have a? You know, and, and we hear a lot about these. I mean, did it have like a cone-shaped head, or was it rounded? No, actually, actually, that the head wasn't round, and the head wasn't real. It wasn't real steeply coned, but it was. It was more of a coned shape. Um, than rather than being round, but it wasn't a like you see, you know, a, a lot of the great apes. They have a real, a real coned head. I mean, it looks really, really distinguished, but it was coneish, um, very much so. Um, but like I said, the fur, the, the fur on the body um, looked to me like it was. It didn't look to be long and stringy. It looked to be more like you know furry. And, and, and I thought about it since then, and thought that you know my theory is that in the summertime they their coats aren't as thick as they are in the winter time. Just like a dog, a dog will have its winter coat and will have its summer coat. Sure. And so the, the fur around its body looked to be, you know, more closer to its skin instead of, you know, like some of the pictures you see where it's really super um, hairy and the hair hangs down all over the place. And it's real shaggy and unkept. It didn't look like that at all. It looked more, you know, more kept and, and very, very short. Um, as far as as far as the rest of the fur on its body, except for the fur on its head that kind of came down almost like it it had a fur coat, it had fur, and then it had hair as well. Is what it kind of looked like, and also looked like it had uh, like a beard as well. That was all part of its its it, the hair that it was on its head, all kind of blended together, almost like a lion's mane. Yeah, that's uh, that, that's that's pretty interesting. Well, what about like the the length of the arms? I mean, did, did the arms seem to be um, longer than what you would expect a man's arms to be, or was it? Yeah, what, as and I didn't, you know, when it was going through the toolbox, um, you know, you, I, I, it, was, it had its back to us, so I couldn't really tie its elbows were out. Um, but then when it turned around and we got a good profile view, when it started to look toward the mules, um, it was, um, you know, its arms looked pretty I was I was concentrating more on the muscular you know how muscular they were, the biceps and triceps. But when it turned around and started to walk across the lake, around the lake to the other side, that's when I got a really good look um at its stride and its arms. And the arms seemed to me that to hang down below the knees. I mean they're very long arms, but very, very muscular. Right. Um you know, and, and the legs were muscular as well. When it walked I could definitely see the muscles in its thighs and the muscles um in its buttocks flexing as it walked um you know that was that was what was so impressive was just how utterly muscular this creature was it was just one giant muscle sure sure now one more quick question about about the arms and and i think this is important but when like if, if, if i were to want to make my arms look longer i could just dip my shoulders a little bit did they did it seem to have its did the shoulders seem to be square, or were they, or did it seem to be slouching? You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, it you know what when it turned around to walk to walk around the legs, like I said, when I got the the really best look at it, um, and it didn't appear to be slouching. Um, it appeared to you know to be walking um, 
you know, upright, um, pretty sturdy, pretty bold, um, pretty confident, you know, um, just here I come, you know, so it didn't, it didn't appear to be, you know, sloshed over a whole lot, um, at all. Um, whenever I got a good look at it walking. Now, when it was on the bank looking through the toolbox and things, of course, you know, it's slouched because it was looking looking at some things and it was checking checking out whatever we had in the toolbox, the tackle box, and looking at the mules and things. But it did not appear to be slouching as it was walking away. It looked very upright and very confident and very, um, very strong. That's just, uh, it's a great description. Um, and you mentioned the stride a moment ago. Was was the stride like exceptionally long, or, or how how was the stride? Well, I, I think the stride. It, it, I don't think it was trying to get anywhere very fast, but the stride was definitely um, the stride was definitely a, a, very, a, a nice long stride. I mean, it was it was making up ground. It got around that lake really fast, and I've walked around the entire lake before, and it got around very fast. But the thing that was the thing that got me more than anything was it almost seemed like it seemed like it was doing the goose step. Um, like as it was walking, it wouldn't wasn't walking like we would be walking. It was it seemed like it was picking its knees up really high off the ground, um, and as it was walking. But it, I tried to walk like that, and it just and it looks like I'm you know you can tell that I'm being goofy. But this 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 looked very natural. But it looked like it was just making very high high strides with its knees and then coming up and bending um, in, a, in kind of a weird way as it was going. And I, and, and I expected, you know, when we walk, our legs are more um, straight as we walk and maybe just barely the knees bent. This, these knees, as it was walking, the knees were bending quite a bit more than, than what ours do, and that was kind of weird to me. Right, right. Now, would you compare the stride to be a lot like, say, Patty from the Patterson Gimlin film? Um, yeah, I, I, it was pretty close. And, and, you know, and that's another thing I, the, the, the Patterson Gimlin film, um, I definitely believe that that creature is, is a real Sasquatch because the creature I saw look a lot like Patty, except the creature that we saw was a lot, um, leaner. Um, and when I mean, it was a lot more muscular. I think, I think Patty looks like she may have been an, an older, female uh, even though she's very big and muscular but this this animal um or this creature was uh similar to patty um but um very a lot more muscular and the stride was was pretty close was pretty close that's why i'm the patty patterson gimlin film is very believable to me because it was very very close to what i saw excellent excellent now the uh while it was going through the tackle box or while it was doing its thing there, did it make any sounds or, or anything of that nature that, that you can remember? I didn't hear it making any sounds because all we could hear was the um, the mules. And they were, like I said, were kicking up a storm. So I didn't hear it, uh, you know, make any type of sound at all, um, and, and, and which is unfortunate because the mules were just really making a, a very big stink um, right. about the situation. Now, did, did it seem to be disturbed by the by the commotion that the mules were making? Yes, yes. Uh, when it when it got up to walk toward the mules, um, it almost you know from from what I could saw it almost seemed like it had a grimace on its face, like it was very annoyed. And then when it hit its head on the branch, it was even more annoyed. And that's when I thought, here we go, um, these mules are are going to be dead meat. And then we hear the, the scream. Um, which for the best, you know, my best guess would be um, it was another Sasquatch um, making contact because it, it turns around immediately once it hears the scream. And you know, it's almost like, honey, come home, you know, and it turns around and, and takes off and just leaves the mules alone. Uh, and when you said it first turned, and I, and I think this is a this is a great point, when, when it first turned, did it turn like at the waves or did it turn – or did it just move its feet and turn its whole body? It 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 when it first turned, it just moved its feet and turned its whole body. So um, it didn't. Yeah, it didn't turn its waist. Um, it just it just pivoted pivoted one its left foot and turned its whole body to walk toward the mules. 
and then when it moved to go back, same thing. It pivoted on its right foot and turned its whole body and started walking back uh, around the lake to the right. Okay, cool. And cool. when you, you mentioned that it was, it, and I, I'm going to back up for just a second, I, I apologize, but when you mentioned it was annoyed by the commotion from the mules, was it moving pretty fast towards the mules? Like, you know, I, I'm going to get you. Was it was it that type of movement? I, I, I took it as an aggressive movement toward the mules, yes. Um, I took it as, okay, you know, I've had enough. You know, uh, and and it started to head toward them relatively aggressive in a relatively fast manner. Um, like I said, the mules were probably twenty, thirty feet away. It took a, about two steps, and was just a couple feet from them, and then boom, hit its head on the on the branch. So, I, it, to me, I, it, I thought it was a very aggressive move toward the mules. Yes. Sure, sure. And then you hear this scream from out of nowhere. How far away would you guess, and I, and I realize it's just speculation, but how far away would you guess that scream came from? Oh, I would say it was prob- it's probably a good half a mile or so um, to the tree line on the other side of the lake. You know, a good half a mile, uh, three quarters of a mile away. And it, was, and it had to come from that tree line because that's where it disappeared into after, we, after it got around the lake. Um, right. Into the, yeah, it's, it's probably about half a mile, three quarters of a mile. Now, now real quick, now your, your grandfather, you you'd mentioned it had um, a lot of experiences. Apparently, it had some experiences, you know, as he was growing up as well. Um, yes. Did he ever say that what the sound sounded like, or whether that sound was close to what he had heard before, or, or was there ever any talk <laughs> about comparing the two? Yeah, actually. Um, Actually, I, I told him it was just a, a you know a, a loud scream, um, and then he said he told me that he told us that he had heard them scream before. Um, he had heard them whoop before, like whoop whoop. He'd heard them whistle before, and he'd even heard them um, make woodchuck sounds or squirrel sounds before. Um, wow. And he said that they he, he said that they made um, all kinds of different sounds. He's also referenced um, tree knocks and rock knocks. Um, and him and his brothers throughout the years have had, you know, I guess a lot of a lot of sightings um, from afar and some close by and had always just accepted the fact that they were back there and they did a lot of hunting and trapping and just kind of coexisted. Um, I asked my grandpa, I said, did you guys ever want to shoot one or try to shoot one? And he's like, well, why would we ever want to do that? No, none of them ever tried to hurt us. None of them ever came on our property and messed with any of our animals. Why would we want to do that? Um, he kind of just left them alone and coexisted with them and thought that it was pretty cool that he had those things on the family property. Sure, sure. He, he's a wise man. <laughs> yeah. You know, without without giving away the location, you know, and, I, and I'm not asking for a you know, pinpoint location, but is it like... Northwest Kentucky, Southwest Kentucky, or, or what? Can you give us at least that much? Yeah, sure. It's it's actually very close to the Kentucky West Virginia border. Um, really close to the um, um, around the Paintsville area um, in Kentucky. Um, there's there's a lot of uh, beautiful land out throughout there. A lot of a lot of uh, mountains. A, a lot of beautiful scenery. Um, there's a lot of creeks that run through that area. There's a lot of caves. Matter of fact, there are a lot of caves on our family's property um, that, as a kid, we would explore and play around in. So, um, plenty of area um, for them to uh, to wander and to, and to live, and plenty of uh, wildlife, plenty of uh, plant life, vegetation. I mean, very sustainable for for large mammals of that sort. But um, I've heard, you know of you know a lot of sightings in the West Virginia area. Um but if you're right around the Kentucky West Virginia border. Sure, sure. And and, and now you mentioned the caves and you sent me some great pictures of some caves I'm assuming is in that area. Um do do you think and again speculation of course, but do you feel like maybe they use those caves to travel or possibly even live in? Most definitely. Um a, a few years later, um when I was probably 17 or 18, right before 
um, some of the elders in the family began to pass away and the land um, got handed down to some of the younger generations and then unfortunately some a lot of the land got sold but before all that started happening um around christmas time i was there and me and a few of my cousins went um for a little walk and um we were going to go in one of the old caves and goof around and we got a few hundred yards from the cave and actually um saw one from a distance um and actually watched it go into the um, opening of a large cave that was on the side of a um, one of the knobs over there. So I really think they do use those caves um, to to possibly live in. Um, and, and, and a lot of those caves that we've been in, um, a few of them, we went so far when we were exploring them that we would get to areas where there was water um, that we would get in the water and it would get up to about our... our um, chest and then we were afraid we'd hit a, a drop off or something and we got scared so there there are a lot of those caves over in that property that we could not even explore the whole thing in fear that we might get lost or our fall in a sinkhole or something so those caves are massive and i'm not sure how they connect or if they connect i'm sure they do but we never did ever thoroughly go through one we could only go so far and, and we we were too scared to continue Sure, understood, understood. I mean, I, and I, I can't say that I would have felt any different. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But, and this, this second sighting you had, is, is, was it pretty much the same as the first one? The same? I mean, as far as creature type? Well, actually, actually, this one, and this is where I got my theory of the, of the winter coat and the summer coat, um, because this one looked to have a lot. This one looked hairy. Um, this one didn't look furry like a teddy bear like the first one kind of did. This one looked hairy, had very long hair. Um, when it walked and its arm moved, you could actually see strands of hair, um, almost like Chewbacca from Star Wars. You know how Chewbacca, Chewie's got that big old furry coat. It was almost it was very, very hairy, um, but but still very, very big. I didn't get a close, I wasn't as close to this one, um, but it looked like it was the hair was darker and a lot longer um, than the first one we saw. Right. And this time, was it a lot colder outside, I assume? I mean, yes, it was, it, was, it was around Christmas time. Yeah, it was during the Christmas holidays. Well, Kurt, I'll tell you what, I mean, it sounds like you had a, had a great experience, and, and, and I, I believe your story 100%. I, I think it's a, it's a very interesting story, and I hope that uh, our listeners can, can hear that and maybe even – you know, pick up something on it that reminds them of something they had seen, you know, and uh, mm-hmm. and, that, and that's why we do this. And uh, sure, I, I definitely appreciate you taking the time today to go go through your story. Um, is, is there anything else that you want to tell us about that, that you know, you might find relevant? Uh, no, that's that's pretty much it. Um, I do I do want to say I appreciate you uh, giving me the opportunity to share my story. Um, it's always nice to uh, um, to 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 relay information and to uh, exchange. Um, encounters with different people and 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 share what we know. And I think right now uh, that's really all of us um, squatchers got is just each other and and our own encounters to learn from each other to put together as much information and data as we can. And I think that uh, as a group, as a community, um, I think we do a really good job uh, of doing that. I, I, agree. I certainly appreciate the the opportunity to be involved. Well, well, we we definitely appreciate you taking the time to tell the story, um, and if uh, you know if you ever have another encounter or another experience that you want to talk about, feel free to send me a message, and then we'll get something set up. Okay, well, I certainly appreciate it. Well, thank you, Kurt, and uh, you have a great day now, right? All right, thank you. Thank you.